Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today on AGL Live. Today, we're going to talk to a few people who participated in the Flash Challenge. We have Josh Sackle, who is who was at DHS at the time, and he's going to give us his perspective from the government side. We have Ben Morris and Sasha Durkacheva, who are from STSI, one of the companies who participated in the Flash Challenge and who were one of the awardees. Um, as a quick recap, Flash was the innovative proposal process led by DHS last year. Instead of the normal proposal process where vendors submit long written proposals, this focused on a four-hour in-person technical challenge along with a short video and short written approach provided by the vendors. Flash had been canceled this spring but is possibly being revived, and we thought this would be a great forum to hear from those who participated directly in the original. We want to invite our audience members to ask questions of our panelists in Slack, and um, there's a link uh, in our chat right now in the Zoom chat where you can sign up for the Slack channel. Um, I believe there's also a link in your email. Um, our Zoom chat is going to be disabled, so we won't um, have questions going into there. Um, in Slack, you're going to find an AGL Live channel, and I'll be monitoring that for questions. Um, we're also recording this video, and we're going to share it on agilegovleaders.org after this event. Um, so we're going to start with some brief introductions. I'm Elizabeth Fraley, Director of Professional Services at Civic Actions. I'm also in the working group at AGL and I'm going to be moderating today's discussion. Next, we have Josh Sackle. Please introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Joshua Sackle. I am currently the uh, Chief Solutions Architect for Agile and DevOps at Sevatech. At the time of Flash, I was uh, the Applied Technology Division Chief uh, at USCIS and was involved in, in executing uh, that procurement. Thank you. Let's go to Ben. Hi, I'm Ben Morris with STSI, um, and I was involved in our team kind of both on the, I guess, a lot of the surrounding work of getting the team together um, and going and even doing the, the light paperwork side of, of Flash and then also participating in the technical challenge. Great. And Sasha. Hi everyone, uh, I'm from SCSI and I was part of the team and my role on the challenge was actually the Scrum Master role. So I helped facilitate the, all of the activities related towards our Agile delivery of the day. Excellent. All right, we're gonna start with our first question which is directed at Josh. Um, Josh, what are the reasons that compelled DHS to set up Flash? Perhaps you can discuss some limitations and drivers that exist within the public sector which impede vendor selection processes normally employed within commercial organizations? So I'm going to, I'll, I'll try and answer this as, politic, as, as, as realistically, but also making sure that I'm not too politically incorrect. Um, so in terms of why did we want Flash? Uh, Eagle 2 had been awarded and we weren't really finding in an efficient way the vendors on Eagle 2 that we wanted to get to, um, or not so that we want to get to, but had the skills to execute. We could get to them eventually, but it tended to be very inefficient. Uh, so we were trying to create something new where we had proof um, that, that uh, they understood Agile DevOps concepts and where, where it was a limited set who, who we then say, yes, these ones know what they're doing. We have validated that they actually know what they're doing instead of simply could write a proposal. And, and so move forward on with these people as they're doing, uh, as you're doing an agile type development. Um, that was the intent. The other part of, there was also a part which was to try and uh, drive some new, uh, new thinking, new vendors potentially into uh, DHS that were more on the forefront. Um, from a, from a, I, I think everyone is aware that, that the procurement process within government is not necessarily efficient. Even if you have an existing vehicle that you are going to 
to then put a, a task order or an award on. And so the other part of this was to try and find a more efficient way after award, which, well, <laughs> given that it was canceled, we didn't get there, but was also to find a more efficient way to actually get to award um, and have people on the ground and working. I think that answers okay. the pieces there. Great. Yeah, and I think we'll follow up with some of those um, points in a bit. Um, so the next question is for Ben. Um, what was it like to execute this challenge as a vendor? And tell us what it took to organize the response. Um, yeah, I mean, it was different. It, it wasn't necessarily the, uh, the first technical challenge-based procurement, but it was, as far as I know, kind of the biggest in terms of scale of responses and, and potentially the dollar value and, and all those other kind of factors. So it was, in some ways, uh, um, I guess more more visible in that that sense than others. Um, but we had done a couple of other kind of technical challenge related things, none quite in this format. Um, and I think the first step for us was really making sure that we had a good team together, um, that we could field a team in the room, and that included putting together a team of of companies. Um, I'm here today essentially standing in for Trey White of 540 um, and they were you know one of the firms that was part of our team for example um, so really getting uh, making sure that that we could get that you know get the people that were going to be there in the room was was obviously critical and the the firms that we knew could help us deliver should we win the contract and, and should the contract not be canceled um, so that was kind of that that first big step. Um, then, for us, what what we did was twofold. Um, one was we looked at the requirements. So there's a little bit of kind of like classic proposal response sort of stuff of looking at okay, they're they're looking for certain evaluation criteria. Let's make sure that we're hitting on those things. Um, and so we did do a little bit of that. Um, you know, not, not exactly a compliance matrix or anything quite like that, but we definitely made sure to read the instructions and make sure that we're hitting on those things rather than just kind of glossing over, looking at it and saying, yeah, we'll probably do that. Um, and, and then of course, it just came down after that to rehearsals and, um, and not so much that we necessarily needed to practice how to do software development, but really just make sure that we were tailoring our approach to fit in that four hour window, which is a, a decent amount of time. But if you stumble or, or waste time here and there pretty soon, the clock gets eaten up. Um, so it was a, it was definitely a, a unique experience, both from a proposal perspective and from a, um, I guess, executing a, a software development project perspective. Um, but in the end, it was a lot more fun than responding to a written proposal. Okay. <clears throat> Josh, how was evaluating the live challenge exercises different from evaluating written proposals? You could actually see people do it. It was awesome. Um, I, I think there is less, uh, I won't say confusion, um, in a live demo than there is in a written proposal. Um, Having sat on, having sat on both sides of that, not just on or yeah, on both written and and live demos, um, I have found that in the live demos, uh, you can see what they're doing. You hear the discussion. Um, in a written proposal, like, oh, they wrote this. What did they really mean by that? Did they mean this or did they mean this? If they meant this, that's awesome. If they meant this other thing, I'm not entirely sure that I want to, to call this out as a, as a favorable thing. So I think that you have a lot more immediacy um, and a lot more understanding, even though you, you're not necessarily directly interacting all the time. Um, you know, as the evaluator, you, you sit to the side and the product owner and you observe the interaction, but you hear it. Um, I also think uh, from, the other side, what is more difficult is that, that it's now, like as they're doing, as they're doing the, the demo, as they're executing, 
you can't go back and, and revisit it, you know, oh, well, wait, what was this thing that, that they wrote up here in this other section? You need to, to be paying attention and, and as you move at, at, within Flash as we move from room to room or within others when it's, when it's just one group, paying attention over that period of time when it's, when it's you know, that's all that you're doing is paying attention and taking notes. Um, and sometimes it's, yeah, I'm watching everyone type on a keyboard. That isn't necessarily the most exciting part of the, my day. But I think overall that I definitely uh, got more insight into, into how, how teams work together, what the feel of the company was, in addition to can they actually technically perform. Great. Sasha, you were in the room as the Scrum Master for your team. Tell us about the in the room dynamic as a vendor. Did you feel like the team was able to showcase their abilities in four hours? Yeah, so I thought the in room dynamic was actually quite positive, but it was definitely kind of like a controlled chaos. You know, you come in and you try to set up and the best advice that I would give is really set up in a way that you guys know how to move around. It's a pretty small room. And in some scenarios, I've been on certain contracts where you might actually be a team sitting in one room operating together and you have to figure out how do we all maneuver around? How do we all interact with each other, not distract each other? We actually created a rule for our team that we said, if your headphones are in, you don't talk to each other. You let that person because they're having very controlled focus at that time. So it's trying to figure out those little dynamics for ourselves and also how do we interact with the product owners? Because you also don't want too much time where the product owner is just kind of sitting there, them being disinterested. So it's figuring out the dynamic of how do we keep the team working and productive and how do we keep the product owner productive as well during that session. In terms of the showcasing the abilities, I'll be completely honest, I am shocked anybody could build anything in four hours. So I was incredibly happy we could build something in four hours. When I think about a four hour day, like my normal four hour day, this is probably the most productive I've ever seen any team really work because you are so laser focused and you're so prepared going in there and you get so much done. The fact that we had a working product at the end, like honestly, I wanted to pat us on the back at, at the end and cheer because it's, it's so exciting to kind of see that. And it's exciting to see that all this practice you actually did pays off. And it's practice as a team. It's not really building software to the point that Ben made earlier. We've all had experience building software, but the fact that you've gelled as a team and you know you went in and you didn't really panic and you just delivered, that's the true essence of agile delivery is you work through things. Like there were issues that we encountered during the day that we didn't encounter in our practices, but because we had already already gelled as a team, we knew exactly how to handle those issues. And we were very honest with the issues we encountered. And so that kind of honesty with each other and with the product owners during that challenge, I think is what made it really feel like a true project. It wasn't, you know, you don't get to hide in the corner and pretend like you're not encountering a technical issue. It's out there in the open and you're discussing it, which again goes back to that essence of transparency and agile. So I think it was very representative of a true project, of course, very condensed and sped up for a four hour day. Excellent. Josh, this question comes to you. Um, sounds like DHS is going to do something like this for a future procurement. And so what would be the number one thing that you would suggest they keep and the number one thing you would suggest that they change in the next flash? So let's see. I'm going to answer easily, which is the number one thing they should keep is we should continue to do demos. Um, and and I, I want to take a half a second to, and feed off of Sasha, which is to say, yes, if if demo said, hey, this is some of the most productive we've I've seen of four hours in a team, let's do every day as a demo. <laughs> and and you know, I, how how do we how do we get that to be the norm instead of yeah, we're getting to something in in a day or two. Um, and I think that is part of the point of Flash and, and Flash 2, if it ever, if it comes out as, however it comes out. Um, I would absolutely keep the, um, the demo, the execution in the way that it is. Um, obviously, new set of user stories, new challenge to actually resolve. Um, but uh, the one thing that I would change is I would probably, um, I think that we actually had reasonably good tech review. I think we had, uh, and so continuing to have those, but 
but maybe not necessarily having quite as uh, hurried of a schedule um, in terms of doing as many per day as we did. Um, and also uh, actually doing the documentation in a more agile fashion. Uh, it's one of the things that Eric Heisen brought up was that was we were doing an agile procurement but we were doing our procurement documentation in basically a waterfall fashion. And so, and so there was a slight mismatch, which was part of, part of what led to, to that cancellation, it, according to him, and I kind of tend to believe that. Um, so I think I would absolutely like figure out how to get, uh, we had procurement involved, we had everyone involved in executing, but, but in terms of producing the outputs that we needed, there was a lot that was waiting until the end to then produce a set of outputs. And I think that a lot more of that could have been done earlier. Okay, great. Ben, can you tell us about the technical lift? Um, how real was the application and how would you describe the scale for which it, or on which it was built? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it, as a quick background for those that weren't uh, participating in it or um, or if your knowledge is just dated since it's been hard to believe like well over a year since um, the, the, this challenge period, um, it was that you had a four hour period in the room and, and you were kind of seeing a backlog of, of user stories when you walked in the room. But previous to that, you had some outline of the, the sort of high level, what sort of system you're gonna see. And you had also the permission and, and encouragement of of the government of DHS to build some level of scaffolding. So there were kind of the two parts. There was kind of a little pre-built scaffolding, meaning that you know you kind of have a um, some trivial application built, um, sort of like a hello world uh, version of an application built, maybe with uh, basic authentication or, or something like that, and and some of the pipeline and, and hosting type stuff set up. So you you know you're not walking in the room and like. Um, you know, configuring AWS or, or something like that. Uh, so that's kind of the, um, the, the two pieces of it. And I think what was interesting um, was that when you, when it comes to the technical team, I think a lot of us have a tendency to be a little bit overconfident for something like this because so many things can happen so quickly it's kind of easy to say, well, oh, it'll, it won't take long to set that up. Oh, it won't be much work. And so we kind of pushed to do, um, hit some of those technical milestones earlier than we really had to, just because we knew there would inadvertently be little issues. Um, so, you know, we realized, oh, uh, we need to get such and such access to AWS console or, um, you know, or just little things of setting up tools or, well, we need to set up a credit card for, um, you know, to get the, the CI service to work or, or something like that. Um, and, and then there's the kind of in the room part, which was, you know, how fast you iterate and build on, on what it was. Um, but I'd say the, you know, the technical lift was kind of similar to other prototypes we've done where it is real work to build kind of the, the whole app. It's not just like a UI prototype where you're just working in the browser in JavaScript. It was, uh, a bit, a bit more than that because we had a lot of real pieces. You know, the code uh, had code quality scans on on check in and, and a lot of other just, I guess, plumbing that that is out there. To whether you're building, you know, this four hour app or something that you're building over the course of weeks or months. Um, but I mean, overall, the effort was was something that in some of those prep sessions, in kind of borrowed time, uh, was certainly doable, particularly if you have an experienced team of, of people. Um, I think my only kind of like warning um, to anyone walking into something like this is that, you know, just, just keep in mind kind of your natural overconfidence of, of the technical folks that like, yes, a lot of this stuff is pretty easy um, and we do it quite often, but you always forget that, you know, the, the five places that you step your toe um, really quickly setting up, um, you know, your deployment pipeline or whatever. So. Um, so getting it done, uh, the, hitting those initial milestones well ahead of time is, uh, um, is I think one of those keys that helped everything go smoothly later on. Great. I'm gonna take a question from the audience and Sasha, this one's gonna be for you. So this is from Fahim Memon. 
Um, so his question is, how did you handle team formation issues for the challenge, and were you able to show team, team chemistry during the challenge? So I think this is related to what you were talking about earlier, but what, was there anything about um, the team formation that was challenging? And then we'd love to hear about um, whether or not you could show the team chemistry. Yeah, definitely. So one of the things is practice makes perfect. And a lot of people think it's just practicing your technical aspects of the challenge, but it's practicing your actual dynamics. Because we weren't necessarily a team that had worked together on a client together. It was people that had worked together on certain client sites and brought together. And so by practicing, you just naturally gel. It's just like any agile team. You're forming, you're norming, you're storming, and you're trying to figure out how do we interact? And a lot of it is also figuring out the handoffs. That's what we often focus on is you have a four hour challenge and just like you would in any sort of project, you start thinking about what are my dependencies? What are my external dependencies to the other functions of our team, to the product owner? And so by figuring out those, you stumble a lot less. So we actually had really great chemistry. And honestly, part of when you're working together as a team is developing those inside jokes. By the time that we were practicing, you know, we came in and it was very obvious in the room to see that kind of chemistry with our team because we came in with like the snacks that we were using when we were practicing. One of our team members was like obsessed with these coffee cubes that they just got on Amazon. Shout out to Trey. But, you know, we came in and we brought those and, you know, we were so into it that you kind of felt that the team was gelling because a lot of the challenge, I think Josh kind of hit on it, not just can this team build a product, is can this team be someone we want to work with? Because that's part of the Agile delivery also. Agile is very hands-on. You're all sitting together. It's can you bond with your product owner? Can you bond as a team? Do you have good chemistry even within the team? Because especially when you hit issues, like I mentioned, we did hit a technical block during, and we could have sat down, we could have panicked, we could have put our hands up in the air, but because we were already kind of versed in, okay, if we resolve an issue, everybody calm down. We even, we had like little scrums during the challenge and having that kind of dynamic, it just, it really shows of a team that truly has figured out a way to work with each other. Excellent. And Ben, I'm gonna ask about the format formation part for you too. You mentioned um, that you were working with partners and that you had time to prep um, before, but how did you know, um, you know, what team members you needed and did you have any challenges in forming that team? Um, I, you know, it was interesting. We kind of had, uh, uh, there was a little bit of a journey to get to the point of kind of deciding to bid and, and, and the team. I think, um, you know, we started uh, talking to, I mentioned uh, 540 um, and, and Trey, uh, and we had started talking with them early on and kind of thought, well, if if uh, if they're on board, then we feel a lot more comfortable, right? And um, and we actually went through a couple of iterations of like, you know, maybe we should join another team or whatever. But um, but ultimately, um, you know, I think we wouldn't have decided to go after it if we didn't have teammates both at the company level, company leadership level, and at the individuals um, or the delivery level that we were really comfortable with um, and. And I think what Sasha mentioned is very correct that it was, uh, uh, you know, the dynamic in the room, I think reflected kind of like broader relationships and so on that, um, that we did have a, a certain level of trust, even though there were a lot of people there in the room, you know, with, either within companies or across companies that had not really worked together on a day to day basis. Um, but because we did put in a little bit of work and it wasn't you know, we didn't have full days to, to grab people and pull them off of projects to get them ready. But just, um, you know, doing a, a lot of uh, a lot of work on uh, the prep work and prep sessions, um, we we're able to establish a certain kind of rapport. Um, and I think one of the things was like a little bit at my expense, like because uh, one of our decisions going in was um, kind of deciding on sort of like our, our dress code, like how we wanted to present ourselves. You know, are we going to walk in in suits and ties or are we going to you know, walk in and cut off shorts and, um, and what kind of vibe do we want to establish? Um, and I think my suggestion or that I, and I think it's where we settled was like basically like dress at the level of uh, wear jeans that you would iron. And like that sort of became a little bit of a, 
um, a joke sort of mildly at my expense. But um, but there's a lot of that sort of stuff that was uh, uh, that I think made it easy. And of course, um, and it's not just the the basic team building and personality stuff, but but also the um, uh, just understanding the the roles and handoffs and um, and the who's doing what of the project and establishing that pretty clearly early on. Like we had, uh, you know, when it came to running the the, the schedule or um, resolving conflicts, then you know that was clearly kind of in Sasha's swim lane. And if it came to technical uh, decisions, um, then that was um, something that Trey was going to resolve. And we kind of had that all clearly mapped out and there were other people in other roles, um, but that made it go rather smoothly. Great. Okay, Josh, next question for you. Um, what advice do you have for government procurement or program people who are considering running a challenge-based procurement? So this is maybe related to the last question you answered about what you would do again or what you wouldn't do again, but what about advice for the people who haven't done this? and they're considering it. Do it. That's my first advice, <laughs> do it, please. Um, I think that it, that it provides better, better overall quality to your, to your procurement. At the same time, it's not a, I, I work a lot of agile transformations. It's not an overnight kind of, a, oh, we're just gonna make this change and now we're done. Um, you need to get, you probably need to get some help. Uh, someone who's done it, uh, USDS can provide advice. Um, there are other government groups who have done challenges. Ask for, ask for advice, ask for what other things have worked. Don't just take, you know, one, one groups uh, or one, hey, that worked over there. Let me just repeat exactly what they did. Um, have a discussion around, hey, with this particular challenge, what are the things that we're driving towards? Um, for example, with Flash, uh, Flash, we were... Uh, platform agnostic because we knew that we needed to support Java and .NET and other languages, you know, Ruby, whatever. So we didn't put a, a language requirement into the in certain requirements in terms of you had to actually have code up and you had to have a pipeline. We're not going to tell you what tools you must use in order to do it. Um, and we're going to do basically greenfield development because Flash is going to be across a bunch of different options. At the same time, the challenge demo that we did at USCIS. We provided code before you got there and it was in Java and you were making modifications to it because we knew we were Java. We knew that there was an existing code base that, that we wanted changes to. So as you're doing a challenge, don't just say there was a challenge that worked or didn't and therefore I'm going to repeat it. Think about your environment and how, and how to frame the challenge in such a way that you'll get that you'll get the best team for that for executing in your actual environment. Great. Next question um, I'd like to direct at both Sasha and Ben, and we'll start with Sasha. Um, can you share some advice for bidding firms on what they should do to prepare for a technical challenge? And Sasha, you want to start? Go ahead. Sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, got a little frozen there. Um, so I'm not going to give away all of our secret sauce, but to give a little advice for teams is, so you know how when you're an actor and people say, imagine the crowds in their underwear, don't do that for this, but kind of pretend like you're not in a room being watched. I think a lot of people get a little psyched out of knowing the fact that you have a bunch of people walking around examining you. There were people with clipboards, you know, taking down notes, having very serious faces. That can really psych some people out. Uh, we actually, when we were practicing, we had some people practicing as the product owners also, because it wasn't just about our team as how do we interact with the product owners. So it's get comfortable. And practice makes perfect. And again, it's not about practicing your technical skills. You can get together a lot of teams that have the technical skills. It's practicing your dynamic as a team, because that, in essence, is your secret sauce. Every team is demonstrating how do they work. And the question really goes to the government of, is this a team that you would be willing to work with? Because that at the end, I think at the end of the day is a big differentiator. The other thing that I would say is, if you've ever done a case interview, so certain companies do case interviews where they say, okay, here's a scenario, walk through the scenario. And what a lot of people forget is to actually talk their steps out loud 
It's make sure you guys are actually demonstrating what are you doing? Because things that you might take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis during your execution, you should really remember to really vocalize that kind of stuff. And everything else, that's our secret sauce. Ben, what about you? What, what advice um, would you have for bidding firms on how to prepare? Um, so I think there's a couple of things. I mean, for, you know, per Josh's point, this is not, um, every challenge will be a little bit different as far as uh, something like what technology choices. I mean, for us, I think it seemed like the, in the procurement, one of the things we were look, they were looking for was a modern approach. So we made sure that we were using a modern tech stack. And in fact, uh, I mean, our, our, our repo, we've kind of just, we opened it up. It's, it's available um, that people can look at. So, you know, we use tools um, uh, like Node and um, Angular and, um, and other kind of modern stack and deployed to AWS, et cetera. Um, so that, I think in this case, that was part of not just what would make us effective, but we felt, and, and maybe Josh could comment on, you know, if this is true or not, but we felt that the the choice of stack would maybe be a little bit of an indicator, or that, that was a form of communication to the government, as opposed to, um, um, you know, going with, um, I guess, certain technologies may have been, um, I think I think some were kind of ruled out, you know, uh, non-open source. Um, and then the other thing, the, the word we used echoing what Sasha was talking about was um, theatrics uh, was a word that we used some in our rehearsals. And that didn't really mean like we're going to fake doing something, but it just meant that for the things that we're doing that are important, it's, it's really critical that we don't do them quietly. Um, so if two people ran into a problem, you know, the, the front end uh, or somebody coding up the front end had a question about um, a mock-up or, or what was, uh, or what we should be building, you know, they don't want to go kind of whisper and quietly get the attention of a UX designer and say, hey, what did we mean here? Um, you want to kind of raise that up and make that a very public kind of thing that you're going to get together with that person and, um, and collaborate or get some information and just make that very explicit. Um, and then I think the last thing that was kind of like a helpful tactical thing was uh, paying attention to the timeline. So any of these that are time boxed, um, you know, the first five minutes really matter, the first 15 minutes really matter. Um, and really having a very clear, you know, even written down in detail of who's doing what, you know, you know so, so as soon as they, they start the clock, then every person in the room should know exactly what they're gonna be doing at that time. Uh, rather than kind of just sitting around and, and figuring things out because, you know, wasting 10 minutes or, or 15 minutes uh, really sets you back um, in a significant way. Um, and especially if there's any kind of confusion down the line that can sort of, I guess, compound a bit. Um, and then, you know, I think, you know, otherwise, I mean, I'm, uh, my philosophy is that we're happy to to share anything else as far as our lessons, just because we'd rather see um, we'd rather see more of this stuff happen. So we'd rather that the industry like get better at it. And if there's anything that we can contribute to the industry learning for it, then um, we're all for it. So that more of these challenges can uh, can happen instead of writing proposals because that's no fun. <laughs> Great, thank you, um, Josh. So next question for you and. Um, for context here, you had 111 technical challenges in five weeks. So the question is, um, what did you have to do to accommodate the vast scale of the flash challenge? And please tell us about the logistics and if they, if it was effective. So let's see, I can't answer, was it effective in the negative because, well, we awarded and that would get me in trouble. Um, or potentially, not really, but um, so we actually ended up creating, um, creating, so there were two evaluation teams um, and we ran eight, uh, is that right? Yeah, eight uh, demos per day. Um, so four for each evaluation team. And then, and then when all the demo people went, when all the people performing demos went home, 
the government stayed and discussed everything that had happened during that day and came to, to uh, this is one of the good things, came to uh, immediate agreement on, on kind of a generic, hey, what did we see, what did we hear today, so that we weren't forgetting what it was that happened in today's demos. Um, ideally, so uh, they worked, we got through, I think that it would have been, um, if there weren't some of the issues with documentation, I think that it, that it would have been interesting to have gone through the protest and gotten GSA's um, commentary on it uh, and whether or not they, they sustained or, or said no to the protests um, to at least have some, some external balance. But uh, if I was doing it again, I would probably not, not try and do 111 in five weeks. I think that was, that was uh, a lot of work and a lot and very stressful. Uh, one of the things that did help um, was the number of people that we had at both locations who were not actually evaluators um, to help run logistics. Um, there were several people at both locations, in addition to the product owners, who were literally just to ensure that the logistics happened right. This, this team started at this time and making a note, and therefore their midpoint when all the evaluators need to be there to see the midpoint is at this time and and cat herding or wrangling or whatever um, the groups to to come around i think if if i was there were lots of reasons for why we did it that way but if i was doing it again and had and had infinite time and infinite people and whatever else that i would probably i would probably go to two maybe three demos rather than four a day and i would I would limit it to one team and let it go a little bit longer. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question from the audience. Um, Tim Nolan asks, Josh, are there plans, do you know plans, I guess, to use the flash technique with other departments? I have heard rumors, but I don't know of anything for sure. And I certainly hope that they do something similar, <laughs> but I don't know yeah. definitive stuff that's coming. Okay. Um, and then Fahim asks Josh, um, somebody from the Flash procurement mentioned that a lot of teams in the challenge were more focused on development instead of user experience and design. Did you notice any similar trends? Yes. Um, you, there may be some similarities in the people that won and that, and that they actually were able to balance um, development and UX. Um, the number of there were, there, there were teams, let's see, there were 111, so this doesn't, I, there were teams um, who, uh, for anyone who participated, when you came in, we had it, there was a set of user stories for which Ben has mentioned already, which was way too long for you to possibly develop, something that I fully uh, support and, and may have pushed for, um, is that there are too many stories for you to possibly do them all in four hours, so you need to, we need to see how you prioritize, how you, how you figure that out. Well, in order to do that, you need to interact with the product owner. And some teams immediately went to the product owner and started asking them questions about different priorities and got a prioritized list relatively fast. Some, some teams went off on their own and tried to figure out the priorities without engaging the product owner. And you're like, um, you have someone here. Um, and, and some teams did some combinations of that. So I, it's, it's definitely um, a, a key differentiator. Um, and one of the things, honestly, one of the reasons for running, for doing Flash, because it's something that, that wasn't very, that wasn't called out in when Eagle was awarded. And so it was something that was going to help us differentiate Flash and make sure that we had teams that could do the full um, delivery that wasn't just, hey, we're gonna execute. We can execute development, but we don't really know how to engage the user, how to, in an agile fashion where you have this iterative kind of process. Great. Sasha, can you tell us about how your team approached user experience? Uh, I can hear you. Okay, sorry, it keeps freezing. Uh, 
So we actually had two UX people on our team. And so part of what we decided was that we would have the UX people partner with Ben, who was functioning as our business analyst, and we had Trey as our technical lead, myself as a scrum master. So we kind of used the, the UX guys and our dedicated roles to really facilitate the conversations of the product owner. So when we first got the list of the user stories, we took a look at them and then we engaged the product owner to actually actively prioritize with us, which is when we found out there was actually a whole prioritize list. So us asking that question early on ended up saving us time because kind of like what Josh said, our first inclination was, well, should we do some initial prioritization before we engage the product owner? But again, because we wanted to make sure that the product owner was engaged throughout the entire time, it actually ended up saving us time by engaging them early on. And part of it was, you know, every time that the developers had a question, it wasn't just a developer going directly to the product owner to say, hey, what did you think about this? We always partnered the UX designers and the business analysts with the developer and the product owner because we wanted to make sure that it was really, you need that full life cycle because everyone kind of brings a different perspective. Trey would look at it from a technical implementation, what's feasible. The UX designers would look at it from a best practice. Then we had our front end guys who would say, okay, well, in this time frame, this is what I can do. And then Ben looking at it from a perspective of, are we satisfying the user requirements? So it really was having that kind of holistic view from a discipline perspective, because when you think about it in Agile, you want that cross-functional team. So we were always interacting with that product owners through a cross-functional perspective. It wasn't just one function in the product owner. It was always, let's attack the problem all together. Because again, it's a block for one of us is a block for all of us. So we would always tackle the problems that way and tackle all of the product owner conversations in that sort of way as well, because we didn't want the UX designer promising something that the front end developers couldn't design in the time. So it was really that kind of partnership to ensure feasibility as well. Great. Um, ben, next question for you. If there's anything you would want to tell DHS, if they're gonna do this again, um, what would you like them to hear from the vendor perspective as they plan the next technical challenge? Um, I, I think the, I mean, the first and foremost, uh, you know, we were, us and, and most of the other awardees were part of the, um, the open letter to DHS where if you haven't seen it, it's, um, it's out there, but um, I can even, I can drop a link to it. Uh, but basically we just said like, you know, please keep doing this stuff. Um, so I, the biggest thing is, keep going in this direction. I mean, I, I didn't respond to Eagle or Eagle 2, um, but I would just imagine that it was kind of a nightmare of paperwork and compliance. And um, and I think the, the combination of what is enjoyable to do um, and what is of value to the government and evaluating capability, um, this is definitely the right direction to go in. So I, um, so I wouldn't want to nitpick too much. And, I, and I've had other conversations. I mean, to, to DHS's credit, they've done, a, a, I think, a pretty good job, more so than you see in almost any other, uh, or in, in other um, procurements that I've seen, of following up. And they've done interviews with winning and losing vendors and so on. So they have, I think, put forward a pretty good effort to learn lessons from this. And, um, and there's a couple things that I think have I've personally been asked about a lot of times, like the challenge length. Um, personally, I thought four hours is pretty good to get a sense of both the process side of how you engage the, the UX sort of disciplines and so on. And then also, um, uh, it's enough time to observe some of the technical practice. Um, so actually seeing something go through a, you know, a test driven development process and be deployed and so on. It's, it's a short, but um, it's a comfortable enough amount of time to observe some of that. You know, may, maybe not a, you're not going to see 50 features cranked out, um, but you're going to see at least some points of the end to end process kind of exercised. Um, and then and I think there's there's a lot of other things. I think the only other thing that I've seen a lot in conversations um, that I would want to impart to the government is um, the idea of, which is a good question of kind of who should be in the room and should they be kind of a committed team? You know, should this be like key personnel of people that are going to work on the projects? Uh, and I would, um, and I'd say that 
to to what Josh was saying earlier about you know you have to design your own thing, your own challenge or your own procurement for the situation. And I think for something like Flash, that's this broad IDIQ that's going to be used by many different components for many different a diverse set of projects. Then the um, the people in the the room matter from a indicator standpoint, but they don't really matter from a um, delivery standpoint. So there's no sense in having key personnel because if you're going to have um, five, ten, however many teams eventually on the ground, potentially, um, you know, ten people don't matter if the vendor is trying to act in a in a bad way. Then they'll have ten stars and ninety duds, right? Um, but for other sorts of procurements, for other types of projects, um, that might matter a lot. Um, but I think that those are kind of the, the couple of biggest things that I've either been, a combination have been asked about and have some kind of opinion about. Right. And Josh, same question for you. What would you like the vendors to hear, you know, if, if one piece of advice or one request that when they participate in the next technical challenge that they would keep in mind? Um, so uh, I, this is going to sound a little weird. Take it seriously. Um, that we've had, we had a few that, you know, oh, well, show up with a lawyer and that was it. Um, like, um, really? Yeah, we're just here to, to, to set a stake in the ground. To, and you're like, that. no, uh, you know, try and work with, with the government and figuring out how to execute through this. Um, how to get how to get better teams in, and I know that everyone believes that they have the best teams. Um, <laughs> that's why they're all bidding. Um, but the other is uh, the other that I would say is, and I understand the purposes of some of these, but I did see you know, and, and you can see this. There are teams that are yeah. Here's the same three or four vendors just juggled around in three different ways so that they come in and do the challenge multiple times. And like, um, if there are reasons for, for, for being in different ways, fine. But if you're a team, be a team. Um, don't, cause that, that adds to the overall, overall um, logistics and, and expense of, of creating this, the, uh, of a vehicle like this. And I, I think that there may be some things in the next flash that will, that will slightly restrict who is coming to two challenges in terms of, yeah, if you've been to one, you don't come to a second. Um, something that definitely was, was in the protest stuff. Um, but that is something that I would, uh, I, I would say, please come show, show the cool stuff that you can do. Don't show us what you think you, we want to see because uh, from the, from the government side, we were really looking for, the innovative, engaging ways that people could do work and not just, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Um, this is what I think that you want to see and therefore I'm going to show it to you. Um, teams were doing pair programming, which, which was awesome and, and I thought it was fabulous. And teams that were, that were, hey, we're going to show you exactly how to do Scrum in a four hour and therefore we're going to do four one hour time box sprints and you're like, okay, think about the challenge and you've only got four hours and how much time are you now devoting to overhead versus, so let's, let's think, about, think about the challenge, the space. Yes, you want to show the theatrics, but show it in, a, in, a, in an intelligent way um, that shows that you know how to think and be agile, not just do a particular methodology. Um, and Josh, we have a question from Tim Nolan that maybe you can sum up in a few sentences. It's a big question, and well, we can post a link there too. But he asks, why was the Flash program discontinued? So Flash was canceled because um, because DHS. So let's see, how how do I answer this in the right way? DHS didn't think in the protest is the fundamental answer. Um, the reason why DHS didn't think it could win the protest is because there was some, there was some administrative kinds of uh, errors that happened on the back end that weren't visible, um, that, that were going to cause hearings and other, and other things, and DHS was, didn't think that the probability of winning was high enough to continue the protests. For most of the technical reasons, 
um, like the technical challenge, the uh, the protests around, you know, hey, you had two teams, all of those things, DHS, at least from what I have heard, um, DHS was willing to push forward on those, but some of the technical errors in terms of submission to GAO, um, which is which is is public knowledge and, and is out there in terms of some changing documents after they got submitted, they're like, yeah, we're going to have serious problems because of this, and so and so they canceled. Mm -hmm. And then I have a question for you around, um, you know, I'm hearing you say that you want to see more of this and that um, it's better than writing proposals. And I'm curious to hear how much effort it took for your team to prepare for this and then of course do it and then anything in the aftermath. Like how did that compare to writing a proposal and, and tell us about why this is so appealing to you on, on you know, bidding for projects. Yeah, I think it's on balance. It's better. I think my um, the really short answer as to why is that you know if you get like after the challenge, you know that that afternoon or the next day, it's like you definitely. I think we all wanted to sort of like collapse or or we were sort of like exhausted. You know, definitely that sense of like crossing the finish line and um, and then like looking to rest for a minute. Um, but that's a lot different than sort of like the bitter burnout feeling that I've felt before working on written proposals. Like you get these weird things where um, uh, you, there's a phrase I've heard from like proposal manager types that is uh, proposals are scored, not read. So it's like this weird thing as a, uh, like writing in that style is something that really burns people out or at least burns out, I think, normal people. Um, where, uh, you know, you're not really, it's not like somebody asks a, a straightforward question and you just write something that makes sense as an answer. Um, it's that you have to hit, okay, there, it's mandated that it's in a certain order, or you have to write to like every little sub element in the statement of work. And it's really awkward and you end up regurgitating a lot of stuff. It just doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel natural and you don't want to write it. and and I'm sure they don't want to read it. It's just sort of like everyone agrees that this is the way it has to be. Um, so it's just very non-productive and it's very burnout focused um, or, or results in, in kind of burnout versus exhaustion. And then the other thing when we've done technical challenges, I think for everyone that we've participated in, um, and we've done several kind of like prototypes and challenges, uh, we always introduce something new so that there's some component of learning I mean, you know, we're not going to try everything new and like so that we can't be productive. But, but you know, if it's a new technology or technique or something, we're always kind of trying to like this is a great experiment. This is a great chance to inject something new. And so we actually learn something coming out of it, which is um, makes it a bit more worthwhile. Um, and then as far as the order, uh, the magnitude of effort, I think Flash was a lot of work, but it was also um, something probably three, four, five times the size of most other things that we've bid on. So from a proportional basis, it was a pretty light lift. I mean, we've uh, spent similar amounts of time on uh, proposals for things that are much, 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 much smaller, like, you know, even like 1% the size. So, um, so there's definitely some sense of proportionality, but um, I, I figure we had, uh, I don't know, five or six kind of partial rehearsal sessions and some were some were more full and and you know other meetings and and side work um, but it was uh, I'd say on on par with a moderate proposal effort for person hours mm -hmm. right and that goes back to what Josh was saying earlier which is show us what you do not what you think we want to see so excellent um, well, I think we are out of questions and I want to thank Sasha, Ben and Josh for joining us and talking about this and I look forward to seeing how technical challenges arise and hopefully we'll be participating in a new one soon. Um, thanks to our audience for the questions and we hope to see you in Slack. 
Um, we're going to send out a video of this call um, on agilegovleaders.org, so you can find it there in your email. And um, just want to thank everyone for attending, and have a great day.